God will answer His promises His time and His way. And we see reasons and ways we can encourage each other to rejoice. And there, I have six different ways that it will encourage you to rejoice this morning. Now the, the first two and the last two are from the text here. Ways number three and number four are found in chapter one and chapter two of Second Peter. But I include them here just briefly, and, and I'm not going to mention them very long or, or, or extensively, but they are part of why Peter is saying, let me tell you, rejoice. Rejoice in God's patience with you. Because God is patient with you. Don't, don't, don't put on God your patience, but God, being long-suffering, is very patient with you. And one of the ways you can rejoice in this is that you, you know that God is also an eternal being. Look at what it says as we look at 2 Peter verses, chapter 3, verses 8. Now he says, but do not overlook this one fact. That's what the false teachers did. They overlooked this one fact. Beloved with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is eternal. He doesn't relate to time like you and me. That's why we can say in this world, when he's active in this world, he does everything in a perfect time. God is always on time. He's never late, he's never early, he's on time. And these false teachers, because of the normality of the world and the fact that Jesus had not seemed to have come back yet, they would say, hey, we don't have to submit to the judgment of God. We're not accountable to God anymore. We can, we can live our lives the way we want to. But God is saying to, to His readers and to you and to me this morning, God's patience is proof that God is eternal. His time is not like ours. We are beings that live in time. God does not live in time or is He confined by time. Peter goes back to Psalm chapter 90, and he reminds us that one day, he says here, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Now he's not saying that literally one to God, okay, one day is a thousand years. And so we can calculate the end of the world because, you know, there, there are certain days of creation and people would take that and expand that. What he's saying is that the, in a metaphoric way that God is not confined by our timeliness. God's not that way. God's life and man's life are different. When you come to God for salvation, you are coming to God who is above time and can answer all of your promises and all of your questions without getting tired because He doesn't run down. God is not like a clock that runs down. He's not like you or me that needs sleep. And see, we are fascinated with time. I've seen shows where it says when you travel the speed of life, time slows down, all these different... But we're always, as human beings, living in time. God is, is, is above time. C.S. Lewis provides perhaps one of the best illustrations or metaphors that I can find about how God relates to His activity in the world. And C.S. Lewis says that God is like the author of a book. He is free to start at the end and determine the end without even writing the beginning. He can write the middle part of it, he can write the first part of it, and he can start writing the first part of it and leave in the time of the book and come back and start a year later within the time of the book and no time has gone past for God. A human author can leave a book on the shelf for years and years, come back and start writing it, and the time of the book has not changed either. So when, when we realize God is patient with us, we can rejoice in God's patience because God is not confined by time. God is eternal. 
In verse 9 it says, God is not so slow to fulfill His promise, that means. God's not slow. And, it, and, and I know this verse is a, is a controversial verse many times, but it says here, as some count slowness, but is patience with you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Now there are people who would say that the, the reference or the object of what, who he's talking about is the people in the church or his people that uh, he's writing to, not everybody in the world. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to, people like that are trying to keep from saying that God has a desire to, to reach and to see everybody repent, but He just can't do it. There's a limitation on God that He just can't save everybody and so He can't plan it, He can't create something that, that allows for that or that, that produces that. So, so He has this unmet will. Let me just say, bluntly, God does not have any unmet will. Did you hear that? God does not have an unmet will. But when the author and Peter was describing this, Remember, this, what we tend to do with passages like this and talking about God's patience in eternity, we, we tend to shift the whole focus of a single verse to a topic such as uh, universalism, or God really, really, really wants to do it, but He can't. And we, we, we create doctrines that weren't ever intended by the author of the Scripture in that verse. Now, I think it is, very, it is fine to say that he's talking about the churches that... He's, he's talking about you, the people he's writing to especially. Because he says he is patient toward you. Aren't you glad about that? That God, being eternity, has all the time in the world above time, is patient with you, and that his goal of patience is that you would repent. And he says that not wishing any perish, but all should reach repentance. And now, other people would say, including someone like Tom Schreiner, Dr. Schreiner, and John Piper would say that this is about, really about all men. He, he, he does have a desire and doesn't take great joy in the death or the perishing of the wicked. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 32, for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. So turn and live. Amen. There, we have to balance what we believe with the breath of Scripture. Because in the Gospel, what motivates God in His love is the, and, and to show patience to people is a general love that He has and that, that, that he has a desire for people in the world, but it doesn't mean that God has an unfulfilled will. We're not going to get into the idea where people call the two wills of God, a will of decree and will of desire, but, but those things, I think, adequately and exegetically explain this particular verse. That God... And he's much greater than we are, and we don't understand the reasons many times that he does things that are kept in secret from us, or mysteries that are in the Bible. But he, he, he counts, he's talking about, how would I put it? He's talking about patience. That's the main thing here. It's not about atonement, it's not about universalism. Because one of the things that we know is that God has already stated that not everybody will be saved. The Bible says the way is what? Broad. That leads to what? And the way is narrow that leads to life. That's why I would never name a church Broadway Baptist Church. <laughs> Just, just a side comment there. <laughs> Universalism is not in God's plan 
poor idea. Because the Bible says that He saves, in John 6, 37, He says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And I will, whoever comes, I will not cast out. And later on He says, Whoever the Father gives, He will raise them up on that last day. Amen. So salvation is secure. It's real. And if we rejoice in the, in the patience of God, we have to understand that God is eternal. He's not confined by our time. He is not slow about His promises. And, he, and the purpose of His patience really is the point of this verse and these two verses is that you and everybody in here would come to a place of repentance before the Almighty God. You say, well, and the false teacher says you don't have to do that. God's not coming back. There is not going to be a second coming. There will be no judgment. And the Bible says absolutely there is going to be a judgment. There is going to be accountability. That you are going to stand before God. And that is so important that we get across when we come and talk about Jesus Christ. He is not just the, the goody-goody friend that you have on the side. He is the Lord of glory. He is the man who, who, became, who, who didn't become. Who, he was 100% man. He was 100% God. And when he went to that cross, he was doing exactly what God wanted to have done at the right time. So the way we rejoice in God's patience to us, in God's patience to you, is to realize that God is not confined by time. We serve a great and wonderful, mighty and majestic God. It's a wonderful thing. See, the purpose of God's patience in, 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 his, in His character of eternity is repentance. E even Romans chapter 2, verse 11 says, Do you presume on the riches of His, listen, his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? See, God would be perfectly just if He destroyed the world right now with fire. And you would be consumed, and you would have to stand before God and give an account with God. And, and so many times, in the way we do evangelism day, we never bring the person who is unrepentant and has no desire for God to realize that they are going to stand before the God because they are still accountable to the creator of this universe. We can rejoice in God's patience. The false teachers will, will, will doubt God and say, He's not we're not accountable to Him, but we know we're accountable. And we can rejoice that God has given us time to continue to repent and to come and, and embrace the cross and embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's one way and a great way that we celebrate God's patience is to realize God is not confined by time.